the mark of a great panel is when you're learning something. So I'm scribbling notes, and I, I love this. Uh, Heather, your trauma motif, Erythemi, your sense of who's left behind in this. My friend Alan, your sense that opportunity and our Roosevelt, I'm gonna call it the Roosevelt Plus moment. Uh, I think this is really inspiring to start, so I'm inspired. So my word about this moment is to talk more about inequality and asset inequality. And I wanna come back and talk about why I think we have a moment to do something about this intractable asset inequality. I'm speaking to a room of powerful women researchers, many of whom I funded, I'm sure, when I was in the giveaway money business at the Ford Foundation. But just so you know, this is the counting up of what we own at the end of the day. And the stat I have with me today, thanks to Good Research Associates, is that in 2007, the bottom 50% of net worth distribution in the US held only 2.5% of the total. And of course, the reverse of that, the top 5% holds 60.4% of all net worth. And I'm not reading the decimal points wrong there. This is huge disparity in this country. Another way to say it is that at the bottom, if you look at the bottom of assets in this country, those households in the 25 and 50%, what the median value of what they own, and this is everything, the equity in their homes, is $10,900. This is the bottom 50. This isn't poor, just marginalized, left behind. This is all of us. It's Main Street. And so I very much echo what Heather is sensing. I think the sense of inequality is, is deeper now. The racial wealth gap, which has been powerfully discussed now over the last uh, 15 years, thanks to powerful scholars, many in this room, is also extremely blunt. Uh, the simple stat I brought is that for every dollar owned by the median white family in the US, every dollar, the typical Latino family has 12 cents, and the typical African American family has a dime. So this is a huge, we're not talking about a lot of money, but we have even a blunter uh, inequity when we look in racial terms. Uh, and I should have brought the gender stats, but you've had enough, I got three minutes, so we'll, we'll come to that. So I wanna talk about two things, why we should care about this, why is this an issue, and what can be done. I think the reason to care is that I think this kind of in inequality is holding us back. I think it is the thing that is holding back from essentially an opportunity society. If opportunity is our value and our vision, then we know that you can't get off the hamster wheel if you don't own anything. You just are always struggling. And it's been, <coughs> it's exciting to think that we found possibly the spot which is, which is budgeable. Because I'm not sure, if we look just at the American economy, and there are other economists, I'm, a, I'm an ex-banker, so I won't claim your territory, Heather. <laughs> But I think our ability to move wage rates significantly may be limited in a global economy on just incomes. So can we then look at the asset side and use the tools of the market and of our government policy to reward the asset side? That's what I've been looking at. So I have a new term, which is I think we've got shovel-ready ideas. I think we've been funding them for a long time. We've been testing, piloting. It's great work when nobody wants to move anything. We should keep studying. But I think it's time to use the shovel-ready ideas and move them into Washington. It's the work I've been privileged to do over the last six years since I left with Alan and his colleagues at the Ford Foundation. I think it's time to move what we've known. What was my story? I saw individual development accounts. I saw women particularly saving. This work grew out of the microfinance work. It was looking at what is, what is it that drives the ability to accrue assets? What's holding us back? If we know that home ownership or business ownership or retirement savings, just pick three, are the drivers, if we just wanted everybody to get to a nest egg of 100 grand instead of 10, what would drive it? It would be what you owned, a house, a business or a, a significant retirement pool. What's holding us back from developing that? And this is where I think we have some real thinking that's been plumbed by researchers all through this country. We actually know that there is capacity to save. We know that matches matter, that people do respond to incentives. We know that we can use the best of behavioral econo economics to reward people even if they don't know it. So that when we work on wages to the best we can, then we can also be building the complement to those wages. I think we know how to do it. 
I think it's in our tax policy, and I think we have a moment to do that. There are bills moving through. The President has talked about new ideas of retirement security. I think we should push to expand those, and I love Alan's uh, talk about don't think too small. If this is our Roosevelt Plus moment, I hope we'll take what we learned out in those small communities, both rural and urban, about how people would save up a dollar to get three and match and move into their first house with a good mortgage. I think we know a lot of this, and it is time to move it, to make it part of the fabric of, our, of how we live, what's on our tax form, how we hold our assets. So those are the kind of ideas I work on. I think they're shovel ready, and I, I plan to keep shoveling in this uh, administration. Thank you.